Okay, welcome back. It is early October 1869, where we left off. Um, having really initiated for ourselves this time uh, the next sort of bout of hostilities with the Austrians in what is becoming a kind of forever war. Uh, we had the Summer War in 68 last year, which was very brief, and I opted uh, to secure a peace deal fairly early on and secure Montenegro, which should have been our first kind of territorial acquisition um, since the beginning of the campaign in Europe and a, a, you know a, a real kind of concrete break with the historical script. Uh, Montenegro begins the game as really an autonomous principality which the Austrians had absorbed. The Austrians obviously have even with the options set to historical claims for example on Bel uh, Belgrade and also Montenegro and I, th I think also Bucharest. Um, it's been a successful beginning uh, to this kind of round, for the most part anyway. Um, of course, there is the kind of lingering issue of, of Austria having made a peace with Russia simultaneous uh, with our commencement of, of uh, operations. They are still at war with Italy and doing quite well. The hope is Italy doesn't bail now and kind of, uh, you know, shows a bit of resolve and um, fights for the long haul because with us really kind of pushing hard against the southern Austrian uh, frontier, the Italians would be in a position to recover their own position and, you know, push for vincere. But it's, um, we are going to be looking at a tougher fight than we anticipated with peace with Russia. We can see that even with the opening kind of uh, battles, there's a really big Austrian attempt to push down into Moldavia. Um, we score a big victory there. We get two national morale points for it. And we inflict heavy casualties on the Austrians. Our force is very experienced now. We have very experienced commanders, of course. And we also have, you know, uh, plowed a huge amount of resources into ensuring that we have, for the most part, technological parity with these European powers or these northern European powers. Uh, so a big victory in the bag. We inflict 100,000 casualties. Uh, it's good to see. It's worth having a It's a short action. It's worth having a look through just to see if there's any intelligence we can glean from the kind of um, character of Austrian formations. I mean, these look like, for the most part, standard reserve formations and some all sorts of regular army corps. And commanded by von Lichtenstein, this force is visible, having sustained heavy casualties. We're expecting further pushes, I think, into kind of Moldavia. So we are going to shore that position up. In terms of Army Group East, comprised of four commands with, uh, well, three and a half, let's say, the Seventh Army in construction. We've got a Guard Corps in Constantinople, a cavalry division in Sinop, and a couple of independent artillery and a Provost military police. Uh, regiment in construction in Ankara uh, to bolster that force, put a bit of iron in the glove. Um, we're going to hold a defensive position in the east, and the expectation is this is where most of the Austrian push is going to come, largely just because of the fact that most Austrian forces, or a large part of the Austrian army, will be c returning from the Russian frontier. And again, we can already see some of the consequences of that. But uh, basically, it's going to be set on a defensive posture, hold at all costs. We're going to send up the 6th Army under Ahmed Mutar. Um, also set to a defensive posture, but we're going to move him up into Moldavia. It's a three-day march. Nice clear weather still, even though we are now uh, kind of in, in autumn. Uh, we can see patches of rain in, in the sort of highlands of central Bulgaria. I uh, feel like a bit of a weatherman here. And sort of uh, southern Transylvania. But the weather's still, for the most part, clear. That is obviously subject to change. Now, our erstwhile minor ally um, in Croatia has had repeated problems with kind of insurgencies, partisans overthrowing the state. Um, they might be Austrian loyalists, uh, but they might not be. In fact, loyalty has 60% except for Croats, 30% rebels, 10% Austrians, so they might just be other kinds of rebels, partisans, but we are going to want to try and move to resecure uh, that, partly because the Austrians will be able to transit through legally, they could transit through there whilst it's controlled by rebels. They would have to sort of move their forces out once they returned control to uh, Zagreb, or, you know, to Croatia. Uh, but they're not at war with Croatia, even though Croatia is a minor ally of ours. Croatia has the same position to really what Romania had. It was a kind of minor ally that allowed troop access rights, uh, but was not a combatant. Um, and yeah, Croatia is in, in the same sort of position. What we're going to look to do in terms of Army Group um, West, then, is we've, have, we've secured now the south bank of the Drava kind of um, Danube confluence. We're going to hold a position there, but not with... Uh, the first army. Um, Mehmet Ali is our best offensive commander. We're going to move him north to resecure. It's a five-day march. Resecure Croatia. He can stay in there once it's once it's been resecured. We have transit rights anyway. We're going to cover his left flank with a move north and an assault uh, on Fiume. That's a four-day march. 
so Hussein Avni uh, will get there before Mehmed can provide support, but these Austrian forces are battle damaged. Um, some, from, some from action against us, some from just the units that have been brought in from the Italian front. Uh, so that's under the command of Albert von Ostisch. I think there should be no real issues uh, pushing them back up towards Trieste. But that secures really the kind of left, the kind of left wing of the advance. And also uh, positions um, Mehmed Ali in, in a really good spot to conduct a uh, sort of a forced march through Steinmark to Vienna. I mean, he's really a stone's throw from Vienna. He's that far north. We want to try and secure his right flank. Now that the 5th Army has kind of done its job and the Dalmatian coastline is for the most part secure, we're going to move his force all the way up to Slavonia. That's a 14-day march. We're going to set into an offensive posture and an all-out attack. The reason being is there is a kind of nearly a 10-day period where uh, uh, Slavonian is going to be kind of unoccupied. So we're anticipating that Austrian forces might push down into this position. He will receive support from the 1st Army in Zagreb. Uh, the 1st Army in Zagreb is going to have no real issue Securing Zagreb, this is a very small partisan force. Um, so it, it keeps our forces in a configuration where they can support each other. It, it achieves something almost kind of analogous to kind of continuous front line. We've got uh, formations in every tile already. It'd be very difficult for the Austrians to move through. Um, I don't think they have transit rights with um, Belgrade. Uh, we'll double check that, however, um, because that might have some ramifications in terms of where we place our forces passage right now they do yeah uh, well, actually that's serbia and serbia kind of it doesn't exist as a territorial polity anymore that's the thing yeah uh, they may have secured transit rights with the previous government um as a part of their peace deal because the previous government releases yugoslavia but it means that it ceases to exist so as bonkers as it sounds i don't think serbia does not count as yugoslavia we'll double check that um but there are, you know, again, places like Albania doesn't exist as a territorial, you know, it, there may be some kind of government in waiting somewhere. Um, Moldavia is essentially Romania at this point. It is still called Moldavia. Um, so there's Serbia. And there is Yugoslavia. They are different. Okay, yeah. So it, they, the Austrians do not have transit rights through Yugoslavia, uh, which is now in control of Belgrade. So, that's good. Uh, that gives them no kind of uh, passage rights. And there's no threat there, even though there are Austrian forces in Sombor under uh, Hinnikstein. Uh, what is that? A reserve corps, siege artillery regiment, uh, field de gendarme, so military provosts, um, supply wagon. Looks like It looks like two sort of supply train uh, units. So, yeah, that's that should secure Army Group West and position... Mehmed Ali for a kind of thunder run on Vienna. Um, in the east, I think that's the only thing. We move the 6th Army north. The good thing with Ahmed Mukhtar is he's a really, really good defensive commander. And so that really, really kind of shore up um, Bezid Pasha, uh, his position. One thing we want to have a bit of a look at some of these two star generals. So, uh, for example, Ahmed Ayub. He's a pretty capable commander. I mean, he doesn't got great stats just now, uh, but he's a strong disciplinarian, admired commander, tactician of Elan, and he's only a two-star. He's a lieutenant uh, general. We really want to cultivate um, him as a three-star general because we've got to keep in mind that a lot of these three-stars that we have now, you know, I'm thinking of people like um, Abdul Karim Nadir, um, Abdi Pasha, Hussein Avni Pasha, uh, these are officers that have been with us for two decades now. Okay, they all started out as two-star generals. Um, oh, Bayezid Pasha as well, if you consider that an actual fact. It's, uh, you know, sort of <laughs> Omar Pasha being reincarnated. Yeah, these have all been with us since 1850, and there's a pretty good chance that as we switch into sort of 1870, some of them are going to start retiring. Now, I know that Hussein Avni... He's a big political figure at the end of the 1870s because he becomes Grand Vizier. He's an ally of our monarch, um, Abdulaziz, but kind of becomes a turncoat. He turns Judas and is instrumental in the palace coup against Abdulaziz, spoiler alert, at, at the end of the 1870s. He ends up kind of becoming the full guy for it as well uh, because when eventually... Um, 
you ha when eventually you have the establishment of um, Adil Hamid, um, there's a kind of need really to kind of bump off the other kind of functionaries that were involved in the coup, even though it's very likely that Abdul Hamid himself maybe had a hand in it. it I mean, the coup against Abdul Aziz, there's no historical agreement on it, really. It's a bit ambiguous. But, um, yeah, Hussein Avni kind of, like, uh, becomes the full guy for it. He's executed. So he becomes a political operator, and as Grand Vizier, ends up getting himself in a bit of a pickle. Um, so we know that he's alive into the end of the 1870s. That doesn't necessarily mean he has a field command. Now, I don't know whether the Ottomans had... In the 19th century, I'm not sure to what extent they had a kind of clear separation between the army and state functionaries, whether theirs was still a very classical kind of interpretation, you know, where you have consul-type figures, political figures in command of armies, um, or whether you have a bit of a separation, um, and he becomes a political figure in the aftermath of his military career, and in the same way as the Duke of Wellington, or was it Grant or Sherman? I think it was Grant that became president, wasn't it, in America? Um, but obviously after he, kind of, he's, after he kind of relinquished his commission... So I don't know if he has a field command whilst he's a functioning Grand Vizier or not, or I don't know, uh, I guess time will tell. But in any case, we can expect some of these older commanders who are very experienced to start retiring, and some of the, the sort of the young blood that we have coming through, uh, we're going to be looking at kind of uh, promotion prospects for some of those. So that's pretty much, um, that is for the most part our moves. I think, I mean, we barely fired a shot in securing Romania, really. Uh, we had a couple of actions uh, in the last turn, so the, uh, we had... I think I mean, we kind of saw them uh, as they came through, um, but as a bit of a recap, then uh, in securing Slavonian, we engage what looks like an army, uh, an Austrian army corps plus uh, some garrison forces. It's a fairly comfortable kind of victory. Um, the first big action was uh, okay. So in fact, there were two army corps, one of which was almost largely destroyed. We get a national morale point for that because it's a fairly convincing one. Bucharest is taken with relatively light casualties, you know, 2,600 casualties is extraordinary when you consider that we inflict, you know, just out of 20,000, plus we take 9,600 prisoners um, at Bucharest, so it's a really tidy uh, victory. Um, and then the last big action I think I've already shown is is uh, the Austrian counter-offensive into Moldavia. Um, the only action really with Army Group West, other than Slavonian, is a Spalato, and that's the Austrian forces for the north, and uh, Albrecht von Ostrich. So we know it's a force of approximately 62,000 men, minus the garrison at Spalato, which I guess is about, yeah, it's two, that's about, that's two regiments and about 6,500 men. That's about the strength of those forces. So it looks like the regular forces simply fell back. There was no concerted effort to stand, and that's, that's probably the most, that's that, that force there. Um, it has sustained damage anyway, I think, but that was from the Italian front. So we know that that force is going to be no real issue to kind of deal with. Um, we're going to set the fleet now to an offensive posture. We're going to set the fleet off of, uh, with the kind of Bay of Venice, if you like, the Gulf of Venice. Um, just in case there are any Austrian sort of raiders, I don't think there are. It looks like the Austrian naval combat power is almost zero now. So I think whatever it had has been sunk by the British long ago, which is good. Um, that being the case, we'll actually set it to a defensive posture. We're going to sit off a coast. We are going to po possibly be looking at uh, naval gunfire support for an assault against Trieste. We have taken Trieste before. Um, so I don't think they've done much since the last war we took Trieste. At one point, it was a fairly considerable fortress. It's been broken down. It's now a bit antiquated as a fortress. And it's unlikely. That it looks like most of their money has been spent on field command units, mobile command units. Um... The Austrians have fairly considerable forces in Hungary now. Um, some of them are under strength, badly damaged. Um, some of them not so much. There's Reserve Corps, Regular Corps, Landwehr Infantry Brigade, which despite being called a brigade is more like a division in size. Uh, plus the 6th Army, comprised of 3 units with a power of about 1,100. A Reserve Corps and what I think are supply train units in kind of um, East Budapest. No commanders visible, which means that these are kind of <clears throat> forces really that are kind of, um, you know, almost functioning as garrisons. They're not going to be very effective unless they're commanded. Um, there's a chance Austrian commanders, of course, might be en route. Let's have a look at their rail access to the Russian frontier. See, the eastern part of the country is still very badly developed. And that goes in our favor. It's going to be, it's going to take a longer time for them to kind of strategically redeploy forces from the east because this area is so undeveloped. That said, 
we had that assumption last time, didn't we? And the Austrians ended up assembling a very large force. The Austrian performance in the Summer War, even though it was a victory for us, was impressive. And we have to keep that in mind. Economic administration has been set for the turn. I'm going to double check, make sure there's nothing that I'm missing. Um, uh, I put nitrates back on them for export because we have, we've got a large stockpile of nitrates. Capital's good. Nothing we're going to spend any money on just yet. Manpower's good. State revenue's good. Everything is set for export that needs to be. Um, let's quickly check our assets balance. Yeah, and that's all good. Nothing's nothing's flagging red, so we're meeting domestic consumption for everything. Uh, we're not going to incur any kind of problems there. Um, we've got um, some insurgents in Sulum that we're kind of dealing with. We'll hold a position there on offensive posture. It looks like the Egyptians have tussled with them as well a little bit, although they've fallen back now into Gazala. We're going to hold a position in Sulum. I do not want this region going into uh, Egyptian control. Uh, this is actually a part um, of sort of what became Libya I suppose but this is a part of our colony uh, so we don't want to have happen here what kind of happened to the Russians in Poland where they didn't really successfully put down a revolt other powers stepped in and then just stayed there you know hence why sort of Germany has control Prussia has control of Warsaw for example that eventually I'll tell you what, the one thing that we've been really lucky with this campaign is the fact that Russia's been tied up in like a 10 year campaign in Scandinavia where for whatever reason probably because they're competing with the Prussians they have not achieved the kind of victory points that they need to press home the peace that they're looking for and I guess Prussia's in the same boat it's really good it's a bit like I don't know you know uh, it's it, it's kind of functioned uh, it's a, to buy us a, like you know two decades to kind of get our house in order you know the Russian war in, in Scandinavia is like Jupiter hoovering up all of the asteroids and stuff floating through our solar system and uh, yeah, allowing us, uh, allowing our species to get on its feet. It's kind of had a similar effect for the uh, the Ottoman economy, our ability to kind of uh, yeah, field a really modern, effective army. Um, and that might that might end up being a really kind of zero sum thing in terms of this campaign um, because I played campaigns before with the Ottomans where it's it's uh, set at this difficulty, it's much harder, frankly. Um, so. Yeah, the Russian kind of mistake has um, we benefited from that. One thing that is going to be a real issue with with colonies. Now I play a multiplayer game, um, and the Ottoman player in that game has used an ally to um, conduct exploration parties in the kind of Arabian uh, Peninsula. The Ottomans don't have this in their colonial suite, I guess, because they don't really have much of a tradition by this time of of exploration and this kind of thing of sort of frontier style colonial activity it was much more about sort of prestige you know establishing a commercial presence and you know if you look at map of the ottoman empire even up to 1914 the kind of interior of the arabian peninsula is controlled by local tribes and this sort of thing so they never really consolidate central arabian peninsula but anyway what i did notice is because this area has become explored by an ottoman ally in this multiplayer game i, n I never knew it before but this area here is a part of Hajez and that is tricky because we need an average colonial penetration of 40 in the outlying regions um, in terms of Medina the capital that's fine we've got more than 50 um, now even if we achieve 40 or 40 plus in all these regions we need to make up for the shortfall in two tiles that exist here that's going to be 40 so we need 80 basically we need to raise the colonial pen penetration by another 80 across the board in the, the areas outside of the colonial capital. I don't think that's going to be possible. It's not, the reason being is I thought, okay, fine, it's a much longer game in terms of the Hajiz bringing it into formal colonial status because we could just do it in the 1870s. The colonial expedition party would continuously replay those. Now that caps out at 50. You can't get any more than 50% colonial penetration using military expedition pacify. So that gives us in every region uh, an additional 10, say, colonial penetrations. So it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. That is still 20% shy in terms of the outlying average for us to bring the Hajiz into formal colonial status. As such, there is now a possibility that the Hajiz will always merely be a protectorate uh, for the simple fact that this is terra incognita that we can't really do anything about because the Ottomans just didn't really have that kind of facility. 
Uh, now, we captured um, a prospecting team from the Austrians. The problem is the mere existence of that unit doesn't mean that it gives us access to um, the colonial cards are necessary. I don't know if any of these colonial cards... I mean, the game that I'm playing this multiplayer game, it's like the late 1850s. So I don't know whether the Ottoman player is just uh, eager to maybe secure this region before time, or whether the Ottomans have access to colonial cards, the colonial cards are necessary, later on. We might just leave it a couple of decades and kind of see. And, yeah, it's a shame. But we're going to be kind of limited to Aden. This area is formal colonial status now. This is a part of Arabia, which is, as you might imagine, the remainder of the interior of the Arabian Peninsula. And there's only one tile that's visible. So we, I mean, we've got 29%. Colonial penetration there. That's just from our uh, mission. So, mm, it raises some questions. I mean, again, we could change the options later on to expand the the, uh, the Ottoman access to certain kinds of things. There's a historical question mark over that, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, which would allow us possibly to explore the interior and formally colonize the entire Arabian Peninsula. Um, we go to Ministry of Colonial Affairs. So Arabia, yeah, I mean, if we go to Plus, yeah, I mean, Arabia and Hejaz are both areas. It's a strange thing, then. So the game recognizes that the Ottoman ruling class did actually consider this as their sphere of influence. Um, they consider this as an area that they were looking at. I can't imagine the game would, like... Um, you know, like, indicate that Arabia is such an area the Ottomans are interested in, while simultaneously depriving us of the means to actually achieve that. As such, I think there might be a possibility late game that the Ottomans will have access to maybe a slightly larger a sort of a colonial suite, uh, maybe even new units, so for example, prospecting, we might even be able to build our own prospecting expeditionary forces, uh, but also ex ex exploration forces. They're the things that you need. You basically put them on a tile like this, and you can play cards in adjacent tiles. That's how the exploration team works. And a little bit like colonial um, pacification or military pacification, um, it gives you... It doesn't always fire. It's like a 50-50 chance. It costs quite a lot of money. Uh, but it gives you... As soon as you discover the region, um, it'll give you a bit of colonial penetration there and this sort of thing. Um, so maybe keep an eye on Academy of Sciences and have a look at... I mean, it's never... There's like settlement grants for colonial lands... It's the only colonial kind of thing that we have, really. Um, what does it say? Although the US government had created the legal framework for Indian reservations in 1851, it was only during the Grant administration at the end of the 1860s that uh, a consistent attempt was made to put the policy into practice and move Indian tribes into reservations, often by force. In Canada, the passage of the... Uh, uh, Manitoba Act in 1870 and the Dominion Lands Act in 1872 similarly um, open large tracts of Aboriginal land to white settlements. So what this means concretely is some kind of um, set scripted tech SOC RE settlement Aboriginal. These modifiers will be applied to your faction. Put 10% modifier to the growth rate of the main ethnic uh, of the region uh, equal to the capital region. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't even know what that means. 10% uh, modifier to the growth rate in the main ethnic of the region is one of the national soil ethnic. I mean, that's not even a sentence. But um, so I don't know what it means. Um, I mean, presumably this obviously gives you a bit of a kind of a bit of a kind of um, colonial bath. I'm, I, by the looks of it, I'm guessing a, a bit of a kind of population growth rate, I guess. So, for example, um, people that are ethnically Turkish, because the way that the game maps the Ottoman Empire is that it's a Turkish Empire, which it colloquially is referred to, but it isn't, you know, but anyway. So the assumption is that, that people that are ethnically Turkic would kind of, you know, uh, colonize the, the Levant, and that's not obviously not realistic, really, but um, yeah. Um, I, so I guess there'll be a population growth rate for Turkic people in the Levant and our colonial territories. That has no impact at all, really, on... on what we're looking at um elementary education act well, i guess all we can do is just keep an eye on kind of colonial technologies that emerge and it might just be that there is a technology which hasn't fired yet that other powers just have access to from the beginning you know or something like this so or it might just be that uh, the ottomans are hardwired later on to have access to certain kinds of things we'll see 
We'll give it a couple of decades and see what happens. But yeah, it means we'll do what we can anyway to raise the colonial penetration as much as we can at the Hadjias. Um, yeah, because you never know. Maybe there's some kind of weird... Maybe I'm miscalculating something also. Uh, which means that we, we might have the option anyway to be able to colonize the Hedges. We'll see. That's pretty much it, I think, for this turn. I've got to quickly look through the rest of the orders. Um, make sure there's nothing that's kind of really important that I'm missing. I'm going to have a quick look at Eritrea in a moment also. Let's quickly check the supply situation. Supplies in Sarajevo are heavily depleted, and that's because of the concentration of force uh, that we've assembled here. Um, and they'll probably be the same with Bucharest, although we've got a lot of adjacent supply in Constanta, Plevna, Sofia. So Army Group East is in a slightly better supply situation. But we capture supplies at Spalato anyway, so that's okay. Good run for domestic market sales, incidentally. I mean, we don't even we, we hold any a little bit of additional territory. The Dalmatian coastline and Romania, and it's bumped us up to just under a thousand. Exports remain consistently high. Imports are also fairly high. That's because of the gold exchange mechanism that we have set in place. Uh, at some point, we will cool off on that, only because we're just making so much in diamonds now um, that it's going to. Um... Well, there's economic crisis there between France and Spain. Uh, let's have a look now. We have seen a couple of these before. I've been playing the game for sort of 10 years, and I still don't completely understand how this works, to tell you the truth. Uh, but let's have a look. So left to right, just cause indicator. Um, so the political, the prestige stash is 1,224. So that's divvied out, depending on who wins or loses. Um, oh, it's, only, it's a one-round thing anyway. Okay, brilliant. So Spain got the upper hand in the, the opening play. Um... And remains in possession of Rabat. Okay, so it's an attempt for France to move in Rabat. Debates turn out, blah, 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 blah. Diplomats from France were brilliant and humiliated. The plenipotentiaries of Spain. Prestige gain for France is 11. Okay, so, so France still gets most of the prestige, which is bewildering. But yeah, so uh, the just cause indicator is plus one. And the initiator... See, it's strange, it doesn't even say which side is which. Usually it has France or... Uh, Army maneuver issue my ultimatum. Just a, well, we could probably be able to tell from here who won. Minus dominance is minus uh, one. Intensity is ninety one hundred. It means that the crisis becomes a war. Uh, just uh, yeah, just cause indicator minus one. So the person who the country that's initiating it starts off at a disadvantage. I don't really know what happened here. Uh, it's a shame actually because we've seen a few of these crises and. I can kind of get a bit of a feel for it. You obviously have to look at these cards and really think about what card the opponent's going to play. It looks like both of these were fairly belligerent. Uh, so it's, a, it's Army Maneuver plus Issue Ultimatum. That's going to increase intensity and it's just below the threshold for war. So I'm assuming that just one of them folded. Um, France gains most of the prestige, but it looks like uh, Spain wins the practical argument, which is to say it maintains its position in Rabat. And we can see here, so if France had won it completely this area this is kind of what we were hoping would happen when we were making a move against the dutch in sumatra the idea was that we create the conditions that i at stake it triggers a crisis and would have been given would, would have given us an opportunity to play through a kind of crisis um with the dutch and the hope was that if we played our cards right quite literally um it would cause the region to flip so all of the colonial penetration would become ours even if we leave for Fru's prestige it wouldn't have mattered but anyway yeah i mean um Looking at uh, so Spanish colonial penetration here is 77, which means that all French colonial penetration has been subsumed into theirs. So they win the, the practical argument they hold on to. France gets a bit of prestige for it, though, I guess, for whatever reason. Um, anyway, that's it. I'm going to put you on pause and pass turn. I think that's all of the moves made. We'll scroll down, make sure there's nothing else. Um... Come on, Italy, put it together, huh? Every time, every time they manage to do this, for Christ's sake. I mean, they've controlled enough territory now; they should be able to put together a half decent field army. I mean, Christ, 
The Austrians are beating them with one arm tied behind their back. You know what I mean? Crazy. Okay. I'm going to put you on pause. Past turn. It is early October. So we'll see you on the other side in late October. Okay, welcome back. It is late October. And uh, turn has been passed. Let's have a little after action then um, on what's... What kind of military activities we've seen um, in the last two weeks? So first of all, then um, the uh, engagement with the kind of remainder of the rebels at Sulem. These are very understrength forces. Rebels are now being reduced to sort of 750 men. Uh, we'll scratch a few off that. 358 and uh, nice unit cards actually. Um, Sanusi raiders and what look like Greek uniformed type rebels. Interesting. Um, that's the rebels, I think, for the most part dealt with. We'll keep on an offensive posture and just look to clear the region. Crucially, also, we are uh, beginning to re-exercise military control over Sulem. We do have military access rights into Egypt because, of course, we were militarily victorious against them in our last conflict. So we kind of de defaults over, really, to kind of military access rights. Um, that's pretty much uh, it in terms of colonial uh, military actions. So, first big action, then we can see it's a victory because we get two national morale points for it, is an additional Austrian attempt to move into um, Moldovia from, I guess, Bassarabia um, and Bukovina. Um, it's a big action. Austrians are bringing down more forces, so they move in with nearly a quarter of a million men. Uh, again, it's a big victory. Um, we score these quite a lot. It, it, uh, I, I'm, I was actually thinking this when I saw this. It, it's... I'd be cautious when playing this. It is a game that when, when, it, when it's kind of going well for you and you've got your units, kind of, you know, your, your armies in good order, you've spent a lot of money upgrading it, you've got good commanders and experience, you can score some kind of great victories. I mean, this is sensational. It's 994,000 casualties inflicted on the Austrians. Of course, rate of fire is much more significant now. We've got more modern kind of firearms, you know, um, breech loaders, upgraded artillery. So casualties, if our forces are dug in, if the Austrians are crossing a river, which they are, it looks like Austrian forces are quite tired as well. Some of them are sort of in pretty bad shape. Uh, so they're hurling forces quite desperately. Um, and we only lose like 23,000 men. And we take 9,600 casualties. When the boot is on the other foot, and that can easily happen and may well do in this campaign, it's a very unforgiving game. Um, it's, you know, the AI is, as you might imagine, completely remorseless. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to play the Ottomans and depict an entire campaign is because I played them a couple of times before. They're one of my favourite factions to play because I love Ottoman history anyway. Um, but I played a game against... Uh, well, I played a game much like this with the, with the rules set pretty much as they are now. And I fought a war against the Austrians. And I was about 10, 15 years into the game. So it was like the 1860s. Um, and I was defeated really hideously. And um, pushed right back to sort of Adrianople. But I didn't really concentrate anything like force preservation i tended to sort of like you know roll the dice too much gamble too much you get into these kind of lazy habits with kind of grand strategy games a little bit and you kind of think oh i want a quick i want a quick and easy victory you know and um i kind of rage quit that campaign because i devoted so much time and was in a position where i was looking to lose most of the balkans you know they were demanding the independence of like a slew of balkan territories plus they wanted to take bosnia and i was like uh, uh, but after that campaign, I mean, I thought about it for about six months or a year or something, <laughs> you know, and I thought I could have probably recovered that situation if I'd be careful with my force, a bit of force preservation, if I invested in the army a little bit more, you know, um, carefully used state resources, just a little bit more, you know, like uh, early on, I think I could have beaten the Austrians. And anyway, uh, this is maybe the sort of the, the playthrough of that campaign that I wish had happened, but... If he goes against us, of course, it, you know, um, it's not good. But it's a big victory for us, and it's in the bag. Um, and it looks like the losses that we have sustained, uh, we've quickly got up replacements also. We don't have rail access really north of the Danube, but kind of railheads end at Constanta and Plevna. Um, once these regions are taken and integrated into the Empire, we will look to develop rail access into, into kind of Romania. But that's a, yeah, that's a good victory in the bag. A big victory, two national moral points on that. Additional engagement, then this is Hussein Avni moving into uh, Fiume. The Austrian force is slightly larger, so they've got replacements. That force might have also been supplemented by other units being poured in from Italy. Uh, it's a victory. It's it's a much it's much milder business than what we just saw in, in uh, Moldavia. But we inflict 15,000 casualties and we take 6,700. So it's uh, still good. That command is uh, von Ostrich. He's not going to have a very good commander. He's kind of there. Rita Pasha. Incidentally, Rita Pasha is the only senior commander we've got out out of the game really now he's in command of kind of uh, the garrison in eastern anatolia 
and we're going to keep him in that position for the time being. In addition to that, um, this is the engagement at Zagreb, then, uh, the Battle of Zagreb. Now, this is interesting because this, I think, these are Austrian forces that have been brought in to support the rebels, or the rebels draw support from adjacent Austrian forces. That suggests that these rebels were pro-Austrian. That's interesting. They're dealt with, they're given sort of short shrift, and we retake control of Zagreb and return it to our kind of uh, ally. Um, but we do have access rights anyway. We have military control of the outer regions. That will gradually transfer back to um, Croatian control. But we now have the first army under Mehmed Ali well positioned and what looks like an open road to Vienna. And Vienna is not fortified. We destroyed the fort that we built in any case. It's completely open. Um, there are Austrian forces beginning to concentrate in the east. Uh, they now have larger forces on the, um, the west bank of the Danube. So they've moved a lot of their weight into kind of central Hungary or, or the sort of West Bank. So they, that force could possibly move up to Vienna or could try and block at, at sort of Steinmark. But yeah, uh, we could be looking at a thunder run. And, and weather's still really good as well. And, we, you know, it's late October for Christ's sake. I mean, okay, it's rain at sea. But um, sunshine all around, an Indian summer in Europe. Um, no real heavy weather, at least in our theatre of operations. Um, so an open road and clement weather um, is... How long would it take him? Ah, oh, damn! Why can't he move to? Why can't he move via Steinmark? Five days, I guess, because it's a slightly longer journey. We'll do that anyway. In fact, we might as well just leave him to do that. Uh, so five days, and then eleven days. We'll set him to assault posture, all-out attack. Uh, so he'll he'll take Steinmark on route. We are going to do something to deal with the kind of left flank as well. Let's scroll down and. Uh, there's an additional engagement. We get a national moral point from this. This is the Austrians then actually attempting to move in to Croatia themselves. Um, it's a pretty big force there. I mean, it's like 92,000. No commander. Um, so these are, presumably they weren't expecting a big engagement there, but they were looking to slot forces in. Didn't come to pass. I don't know where these forces are. Um, it might even be these forces, some of these forces on the West Bank and the Danube and Hungary. Some of them look like they sustained losses. Um, hmm. That's all of the actions, anyway. So far, it looks like a large part of the Austrian army is probably moving down from the Russian frontier, and a lot of it is in the uh, Italian peninsula. So, what do you do from here? There's still a large Austrian force um, to the north in Russian territory. They will have access rights in Russia, I, I suspect. Um, they will have difficulty supplying a large force like that long term. We're going to hold the position on the right flank uh, for the moment. We've got a good defensive commander in... Um, uh, Akhred Mukhtar, um, a really good defensive commander, plus we've got Bezi Pasha, he's quite an experienced commander now. He's developed fairly kind of decent stats. Um, he'll be the theatre commander as the most sort of senior out of the two. Abdul Karim in the centre is not activated, so he can't conduct a push. The 7th Army is under strength anyway. We're going to start moving some forces up now um, to sort of bring that up to strength. So we've got the strategic reserve in... In Adrian Opener, we've got a cavalry division there anyway, um, plus an artillery brigade, plus I think we'll take these three supply detachments. Now we have rail access as far north as Plevna, that's two days, plus regular transit, six days. Let's bring that back one and we'll actually put it over the formation. Okay. Okay, so it is now set to fuse uh, with that command. Uh, we've got artillery and provosts in Ankar, which are now... They're ready to go. It's a modern artillery, uh, military police. <clears throat> we'll do the same. We'll put them on rails. Nine. Yeah, that's good. That's fine. Um, that's 39 days on a rail, it's 10, so we get them as far north as Plevna, then just get them across the river. And that begins to beef up and construct a respectable command. What we're also going to do is, now Abdul Karim Nadir, he does have a guard corps, but he doesn't have any kind of lieutenant uh, generals. We do have, in Constantinople, of course, we earmarked a two-star um, um, for the command of the garrison. I think we'll set a rule. If, if the war goes sort of south of the Danube, 
we will release Osman Nuri, the commander of the Constantinople garrison. He's a new commander, and we are looking to try and cultivate new talent. He's not going to do that, sitting in command of a garrison that at this moment has absolutely no prospect at all of any, any kind of action. So he's going to be released to go north. And, okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and to uh, to join um, Abdelkrim, to join the Third Army, and he'll be given command of the Imperial Guard Corps. Again, if the war kind of goes a little bit, it gets a bit dicey in the east, if Army Group East gets into trouble, which has happened before, we'll pull them back, south bank of the Danube, set up a defensive sort of position, and we'll release him for the Constantinople garrison. So he'll always be earmarked for that, because he is the perfect commander for it. He's a two-star. Um... The command points for the Constantino uh, Constantinople garrison is only really for the kind of engineers um, or the pioneers. Um, yeah, engineers um, plus the military police that we'll put into that garrison in the event of a siege. And that's only a couple of command points. The rest of it we basically get for free because they're just integrated units. They're just garrison units. In, sort of, uh, in the West, an army group West, Ahmed Pasha is going to hold tight. He's got a good defensive position uh, with river crossing protecting him from every Austrian position. There's a chance they might push him. There is an Austrian commander, Hinkelstein or Hinnickstein, um, in Sombor. But we're going to make our place. We've already set the first army to conduct a march. It's an 80% chance for a forced march that reduces the amount of time. We don't really need to. It's okay. It's 11 days. It's a fairly quick. It's on flat ground. Uh, we wanna, what we're going to try and do is use Hussein Avni to tie up these forces in the west and to really function as a kind of screen because it, uh, it, Austrian units will start coming out of uh, the Italian peninsula, probably using this flat ground to the south of the Alps because this is where they can move forces quite readily. Um, they also don't have rail access through the Alps yet. In fact, they, they don't have the rail access between Venice and uh, and Trieste, uh, so they have to conduct regular march through Udine or Klagenfurt. Um, so we'll set up a screen, I think, in Udine, ultimately, because I think that's where they're likely to push forces, and that'll that'll basically obstruct Austrian forces flooding out of Italy, which I suspect they will do once they realise they're in real trouble. I mean, there's a chance of peace breaking out of Italy anyway. They don't have Rome yet. Um, and I'm assuming Rome is the, is the Italian capital. I'm not sure if it's been set to Rome yet. Um, probably is, I think, by now. If, if the Italian state has formed and it controls Rome, I think by default, um, yeah, it goes to Rome. It, the capital moves to Rome. So to that end, anyway, uh, let's get Hussein Avenue. We're going to move him, first of all, to Istria. Uh, not to, yeah, to Istria, um, to Trieste. Conduct uh, an assault on the fortress of Trieste. And then move north to Klagenfurt. That's 13 days. Um, this is 85% chance of a speed march. We're not going to do that. Because we don't want to get his forces even more disheveled. He's only got a couple of days of recovery at the end of that. That positions him then to move to Udine to hold a line here. On whatever this river is, um, that's the Po. In any case, you'll have it. You'll have a river line on the flat ground from sort of uh, Venice, moving to up towards uh, Vienna. That's the theory. So goes the theory. Um, in any case, that will tie these forces up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in the west, and we'll set them up for, for a screening operation. Um, up it is not activated anyway. Um, we will look to eventually press him north. The thing is, we do need to maintain a force kind of in Slavonian to stop Austrian forces flooding down, making a nuisance of themselves. Even if it's small brigade-sized forces, they might start tearing up rail lines, causing all kinds of problems in the rear. So my instinct might be to hold his force here at the very least. See, we can't even subtract an army corps because we haven't got any two stars. Um, but I really want the two star that we have commanding because I'm, I'm going to have... I'm going to have Abdul Karim Nadir earmarked for an offensive um, into, into Transylvania. So we're going get, get, to get him to move north to Kronstadt when he's activated. We'll hold him here for the time being. In Kronstadt, he can still support the two commands that we have in Moldavia. Um, but we can then begin to push in, put some, apply some pressure here because we want to distract Austrian forces from just simply moving towards Vienna. Um, 
And once we take Kronstadt, move north then I guess into sort of ship, uh, is it Transylvanian or uh, Schaisburg. And then eventually we'll move the 7th Army up also into Hermannstadt. Um, Kronstadt, I think there's a Russian Kronstadt, isn't there? Off of uh, St. Petersburg, an island. I wonder if it means something. Um, Crown State or Crown Estate or something. Just a guess, probably wrong. Okay. That's our moves. Um, Army Group West, Army Group East set. Yeah, that's our moves uh, for the turn. Uh, I'm going to quickly check through other reports, make sure there's nothing else. Finish building a railroad in Varna, that's good. Uh, finish building a mission. So we're getting our colonial penetration up. This is now an Ottoman influenced territory. We've managed to whittle um, Italian penetration down in Mogadishu, so we've now got the upper hand here. Uh, 21%. We don't have diplomats, but we're very close to moving Somalia. 20% for the Italians, 35 for us. Yeah, we're really close to moving Somalia now into kind of uh, colonial status. The Italians still have the upper hand uh, for the time being anyway. Um, in Berbera, in Somaliland, we have 35%. Oh, that's good. And we're beginning to wrestle control of the interior. Now, this is where it gets a little bit slippery. These two regions, Asmara and Aswa, I think they're actually Abyssinian territories that are controlled by brigands. So it might make military control interesting. And, I mean, we know this historically anyway, but that's re it's reflected in game. Uh, the Abyssinians are absolutely no cupcake. I mean, you need kind of... The kind of forces that we have tied up in the European theatre, they're the kind of size forces that we need. To deal with the Abyssinians, they're not going to be dealt with like a kind of small colonial tribal power. They can field really serious forces, as the Italians found out, of course, at Adwa, I think it was, in the 1890s, got their asses handed to them. Um, that's it. Now we've got a little bit of private capital, and I've noticed when doing kind of um, economic administration, uh, chemicals is something that we're going to be looking towards developing. Really, we've got a chemical industry going in in Salonica. And we have enough private capital now to consider um, another one. I'm thinking maybe we start looking at Sofia. Um, it's a large enough city that it can, it's got a population that can kind of sustain. Yeah, it can sustain a bit of a manufacturing base. Uh, 727, 27 manufacturing goods. We've got the capital. It will cost a little bit more because it's a little bit hilly and mountainous. Construction costs more subject to terrain. Uh, we'll see... These are 864. Uh, let's check what our operational costs are. 897. That is not enough. That would incur inflation. So that is uh, not on the cards this, this time around. Uh, we'll leave it a turn. And we'll put that in place then. Um, in I guess early November. So we need more private capital. I think that's it. Um, I have set trade. So 50, and we've got 150. Yeah, that's all good. We won't develop these regions yet, but we do absolutely intend to take them. I'm half tempted to start sticking a railroad into Bucharest um, across the river to link up with Plevna, and that gives us basically a continuous run from Constantinople and indeed from the sort of Anatolian interior, but we won't do it just yet, um, just in case something happens. We never know. Russia intervenes, Britain, whoever else. What I'm thinking of doing is the options that we have set, I'm going to leave them like that for the duration of this war. It makes it a little bit risky, and it is an unforgiving game if it goes against this. But what I'm thinking is if the Ottomans prosecute an offensive war, we should leave the options set to a historical claim. Is that makes it a little bit more of a dangerous world. I think with an Ottoman offensive war, there are you know, it carries with it a greater risk of foreign intervention, and not just for a couple of months. So in the event that we prosecute an offensive war, we will have the options set to allow us to press harsher territorial claims. Incidentally, the Austrians have offered us a peace deal. It's just money. We're not interested, you know. Uh, sort of, um, yeah, not going to happen. Um, 
And then when pieces concluded, we'll switch the options back to create more historical outcomes with regard to AI conflicts. It doesn't affect the AI that much, because like I say, most AI powers do have overlapping border claims. For example, some countries like Spain, which is a decaying power during this period, or a really heavily decayed power, has no territorial interest in France, and, and vice versa, in terms of their metropoles anyway. So it could lead to an ahistorical outcome here, with a kind of territorial conflict between France and, and Spain, that's only going to go, go one way, of course, um, and might lead to a slightly larger France, but um, it's unlikely. It's fairly remote. So we'll leave the options set as they are. Um, white knuckle ride, though that may entail. Economic admin has been set. Colonial cards have been played. Uh, I think for the most part, let me just double check. Um, we are going to continue to play um, uh, pacify expeditions. The reason being is even if late game the option opens up for us to kind of explore this region, of course the Ottomans, you know, like they, they didn't really have, they didn't really have that kind of colonial suite. They weren't looking at kind of exploring new territories or settling the area with a certain kind of ethnic group. It wasn't that kind of empire, and for that reason also we have real problems with soft power. So we don't have any colonial cards that can impact the loyalty of regions, for example. So loyalty in Q8 is quite low. There's some even locals that are pro-British. You know, about seventy percent of them, however, are. Um, just rebels, they just want it anyway. They just want us and the British out. Um, it's also the case of the places like Baghdad, we've got fairly good loyalty there, but we don't have any colonial cards just yet that we can play that impact loyalty very much. Um, so we, we lack a lot of soft power as well to bring people on side. Anyway, it's late October. Um, the reports have all been read. Um, I'll put you on pause and pass the turn, and yeah, we'll, I'll see you on the other side, I guess, in early November. Okay, welcome back. Early November. It's been a pretty lively round in terms of actions, and uh, let's have a look through the battle reports. So the first engagement then is at Trieste. The Austrians have a pretty substantial force there. If we conclude, include their garrison, it's you know over 100,000 men. It's larger than our force, but a lot of those are garrison forces. We inflict a fairly heavy defeat on a combined force, of 30, uh, inflicting 35,000 casualties. Take 10,000 in return. Um, you get a bit of a kind of look at what units they have. It's a fairly short action, but I think. This is really against the forces in the district around the city itself. Um, additional engagement, well, this is at Sulum. So this is really just wrapping up the kind of colonial or the counterinsurgency campaign we've conducted in Sulum. It's successful. We've resecured the region for the most part. Military control is going over to us. We'll keep our unit in place for the time being on a defensive posture. Supplies are a little bit difficult. That's quite far away from the depot at Benghazi. Um, we'll keep them there for another fortnight, uh, maybe slightly longer, and then bring them back to Benghazi. Um, we lost the colonial structures in Saranaika, and we have good penetration there. We don't necessarily need very much, but um, there's nothing we can really build there anyway. Uh, we don't really need to build roads in the interior just yet. I mean, Libya is a colony now of ours, um, but yeah, this insurgency destroyed a, um, a mission in Salum, and I think also a trade post and a mission in Saranaika. So, you know, we can consider reconstructing those. Um, if only for the fact that it suppresses revolt risk long term, so missions probably in both of those locations. It's just that any kind of insurgency that comes from the interior and this kind of terra incognita is going to likely destroy it unless we fortify the region, and that might be over over sort of kill really. But um, so that's Salum. Second engagement at Trieste then is the assault on the fortress. We've pulled out the we've pushed the kind of uh, mobile field units out of the district. They're now moving in on the town. It's successful. I mean, we take most of those prisoners, seventeen thousand six hundred prisoners. Inflict 35,000 uh, casualties, so some of the prisoners are going to be the command forces that we uh, pushed out. Or actually, I think in casualties, that's included, actually. It's 17,000 uh, 17, out of that 35,000 inflicted are prisoners, sort of thing, as opposed to casualties in the field. This is where it gets slippery. So, Mehmet Ali marches through Marburg. Um, there must have been a small garrison in the town that he didn't assault, and he just passed through, running headlong towards Vienna. There's an, um, there's an engagement in Vienna. Uh, this is the combined Austrian force they have. Again, that's also with their substantial garrison. It's a capital city garrison. We'll destroy a part of that. But they have field commands as well. What looks like two army corps located in the in the region. Um, it's a fairly small action. Indecisive. I mean, it is a victory. Um, but it's more disruptive action on the part of the Austrians. Uh, there's a second engagement. Um, again, indecisive. The Austrian force now... Is reduced to 58,000. So one of his army corps has been pulled out. Um, he's moving, trying to get into the city. 
destroys three infantry regiments, inflict a combined loss of 9,800. Uh, of that, 4,800 are prisoners. We only take 1,200 casualties. But this, these disruptive actions on day 12 and 13 are enough, really, to hold Vienna for the Austrians. That's a disappointment. Um, the hope was he'd secure clear lines of communication and take the city in one fell swoop. That might be expecting a bit much. It is a tall order. Uh, but now we have a situation of large Austrian forces on either flank and open, kind of open ground, really, between secure lines of communication, really, as far south as Zagreb, which the Austrians can't touch. Um, yeah, and Vienna, there's the possibility. Now, again, it's not 20th century warfare, the idea of forces being completely enveloped. It doesn't happen in such a mechanical way. Um, but there is, nevertheless, a risk now to Nepal Ali, and with larger Austrian forces moving in, you know, he's a bit vulnerable. There's a large Austrian force now comprised of Christ, one, two, three, four, like five, six army corps, uh, a Landwehr division, which, I mean, Landwehr brigades are division size, so that division is probably halfway between a division and a corps, plus an infantry brigade, plus a host of other forces inside the town. That's a large force. That's well over 100,000 men located now on the, on the kind of west bank of the Danube. Um, with clear flat ground, really, between them and our position of Vienna, or indeed Marburg, if they want to secure the rear. It's tricky. There's nothing we can do. Afman, again, is not activated. Any move he has to make anyway into is, is across the river against a much larger force. So if we move him up, we could try and secure Marburg, but... Um, it's a 16-day march. He won't do it in a fortnight, and he leaves this area open to Austrian forces that try and push down. The Austrian force also in Sombor is now much larger. So we've got large Austrian forces. I mean, probably here, this is sort of, you know, 300,000 to half a million men located really in central Hungary in Sombor. Uh, so this is a dangerous force. And we've only, you know, this is like 80,000 men. Uh, yeah, 97,000 men sitting on the south bank of the Drava. It's a vulnerable position. And Hussein Avni, who was... The idea was he's going to move on to kind of... Um, move on to lie back. He didn't do it. I mean, the action in Trieste was sufficient enough that his force is very disorganized and he wasn't able to press on. And he's probably going to have to sit tight. His force is quite disorganized. I mean, one of the army corps is very disorganized from the assault against the city um probably what we might do is subtract that one core deposit it inside the city to try and speed up uh, cohesion recovery and we'll keep the rest of his force in the field on a defensive posture i think all we can really do and we either choose to move mehmed ali back we just try and hold the position. Um, but there are, you know, if he's pushed hard and defeated, he could be, you know, what if he falls back northward? Um, not as clear cut as I would have liked it. I thought that we were going to kind of seize Vienna in, in one of our clan of classic thunder rounds, but there's a bit of defense in depth from the Austrians here. It's a dicey situation. Uh, I think at the very least, I mean, that's the situation with Army Group West. Um, in terms of other actions, there's only one other, which is the Persian Gulf. We sorted the Mushavir Pasha's uh, Persian Gulf fleet. We got reports of piracy activity in the Persian Gulf. We've been moving around looking for pirates for some time. We keep getting reports, and we just kind of keep missing them in the midst of heavy weather. This time we catch them uh, in kind of clear waters and sink, uh, I guess, what's going to be probably Dow's small kind of uh, pirate boats. Um, Yeah. No losses taken. His force is still in pretty good shape. Um, so we'll bring him back then to Basra. Uh, actually, we'll use Q8 because Q8 is a slightly larger port now. Okay. That's it. That's all the actions. Um, what we are going to do now, I mean, in terms of Army Group East, nothing really this turn. So the Austrians have not attempted to push... Um, Moldavia again. We're in a pretty good position now. Uh, we've managed to kind of beef up the 7th Army uh, with a cavalry division, some independent artillery and some provosts, uh, plus some supply supply detachments to give him a bit more mobility. Uh, we're going to keep him... I mean, he's not activated anyway. Abdi Pasha's not activated. Um, Abdul Karim is. Uh, he's been joined by Osman. Um, Osman Nuri Pasha will give him command of the Imperial Guard Corps. Um... 
And we are going to try and create a bit of pressure now in Transylvania. We want to, we don't want to sit tight here, um, giving the Austrians the comfortable option of bringing forces to the west. So we're going to conduct a move into Transylvania. Uh, first thing on the order of the day, then, I think, is um, Third Army moves into Assault Kronstadt. He gets support from the 6th Army. Um, we're going to move Bezid Pasha also. And we're going to try and secure the rear at... Um, yeah, at Schiesburg, I think. We're going to set into an assault posture also. So we're going to try... We're, going to, like, we're conducting a large offensive into Transylvania. Looking to assault both of these towns. Konstant itself is fortified. Um, we've still got a force for defensive options here. Plus, he received support from adjacent forces. And we've got the 7th Army remaining in a defensive position. Pyro Guard Corps is almost complete, I think. Um, yeah, a little bit of reorganization training, and then we can relocate that force on rails to bolster. That would probably put the 7th Army in a position then to conduct offensive options. So 26, 48. Uh, he's at 50,000. 26 to 48. What's the command required for the... Um, Command cost is only 12, so we can also get the Cavalry Division, an additional Cavalry Division in play, which is being constructed in Sinop. Again, not quite complete yet. So that's it then. I think we push hard in the east. I guess we try and hold a nerve in Vienna. We'll keep him set to an offensive posture. His force is not great, but not terrible. Um, I mean, two of the, two of the commands... Two of the commands do have lieutenant generals um, providing him with assistance. So he's got a good staff command there. But if you can assault and take the city, that would be really good. And he begins the turn in Vienna district anyway. So that's all he's got to do really. It's whether or not he can hold against Austrian counterattacks and not have his command completely overwhelmed. You know, it's on its, it's, on its own. 87,000 men. There's no adjacent support and no lines of communication. So the question is, how quickly is he going to work through these supplies? If he takes Vienna this turn, that gives him some integral supply that's contained within the city. Um, I think we hold position, because if we fall back, you know, there's no guarantee that large Austrian forces don't move into Marburg anyway, or Steinmark. So we, we hold position there. That's the... Um, we're going to go with that. In terms of other reports, nothing else significant to report. Um, no promotions due. Economic administration has been set. Let me just quickly check. No concerns there. We should now have enough private capital accumulated. Yeah, that's good. Um, let's go for a chemical plant in Sofia. It'll take a year to build, of course. Good. That leaves us ample private capital. And manufactured goods. And we've got manufactured goods set to export at about third. So 50 units of manufactured goods is fine. Good. That's pretty much it for this turn. I've got a past turn. Uh, we are in early November. I'll start this war off with a couple of bumper episodes. It's early November. Let's see if we can push through to the end of the year. Um, if, it, if not, then, you know, I'll, I'll rab it less during turns, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, we'll pass turn early November. See you on the other side in late November. Okay, welcome back. It is late November. And we can see then that we've taken Vienna, our national morale is through the ceiling, we've been here before, and theirs is in the toilet. Um, this is probably the most precarious situation we've been in, however, upon taking their capital in a conflict before. Um, I think this is the third or fourth time that we've managed to do this, um, so it's almost a routine event now, but we can see that Mehmet Ali's supplies, um, he's worked through virtually all of the supplies in his supply train, and there's very little supply. It looks like he's already taken most of the supply that was in Vienna itself. There's a small amount of supply there. So we're going to have to rustle something up quickly. To the north in Prague, there is a massive force of 100 to 200,000, 150 to 200,000 men, at a guess. Keep in mind that his force has sustained some casualties, but it's in, for the most part, good shape. He's only a force of 86,000, unsupported. Uh, to the east, uh, there's, again, huge Austrian forces. You know, again, probably about 100,000 or more men. Um, we can't see any commanders, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, yeah. So we're in a really dangerous position. And, of course, they're going to look to move to retake Vienna. And it'll take a bit of time for the loss of Vienna to have a really big impact, I think, also on um, 
their organization and this kind of thing. Um, it's fairly low, but I think it will really sink. You can see a lot of forces are inside the town recovering from casualties and this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, a dangerous a situation. I think it probably means we'll end the video on this turn just to consider things for a day or so. Uh, but the option is Ahmed uh, is activated. We try and punch through, um, secure the ground at the very least around the fort in kind of West Budapest. He is supported uh, by Mehmed Ali uh, in doing that. It does leave Slavonian open, but we can also draw supplies from Zagreb. The other option is, I mean, he, it, the weather's changed now. The Indian summer's over. It's now torrential rain across the Balkans, snow um, in the Alps is to be expected. And the only clement weather is really the flat terrain of kind of northern Italy. Um, so on the surface of it, really, really good. It's whether we can hold this position. Um, Hussein Avni's command has to a large extent recovered. The army corps that we deposited in Trieste. Uh, what have I just done? Um, there we go. Uh, that's kind of, you know, it's done it some favours to recover that force to a large extent. The other option is we try and punch Hussein Avni north. Uh, the problem is the, the the ground is quagmire now, so it's 10 days just to go from Trieste to Lieback, you know, so he's not going to open up a continuous line. I don't know whether Trieste is, adja is, is, is Lieback adjacent to Marburg? Well, Marburg's not taken anyway, so it's moot. Yeah, so a dangerous position. Um, I mean, it, we can draw from Zagreb, and there's a depot there, um, but we have to open up Maiborg. Steinmark is 21 days march, unless we abandon our position in Vienna, but then what's the point? What was the point in even doing it, you know? Um, and by attacking it and then putting back, they retake it, and it just encourages forced concentration on Vienna. Anyway, um, so... Army Group West has done good. We've taken the city. There were, there were, I mean, there were a couple of battles. So there's a first action at Vienna. Just fairly small stuff, you know. Uh, it's small potatoes. I mean, there's 57,000 uh, Austrians there. Most of those in garrison units. So that looks like what, an army corps also. We inflict 18,000 casualties. Um, the second engagement at Vienna. We inflict 3,280 casualties. Of which 1,600 are prisoners. We only lose 300 men. That's the last engagement at Vienna. Uh, so it looks like the garrison simply surrendered. Um, which can happen. Um, they're going to happen with any garrison at any time. You know, it's a danger. Um, I suppose in the last analysis they weren't fortified. And they faced the prospect of annihilation. You know, um, had they have held out for another turn. Which by the looks of it they could have. Mehmed Ali had real trouble prosecuting an assault on the town. Um, yeah. Tricky. Army Group East then, we conducted a large-scale offensive into Transylvania. Um, first engagement is at Kr uh, Kronstadt. There's an Austrian combined force of 77,000. We inflict 25,000 casualties. Two of those are part partisan skirmishers. Two, another two reserve line. And then five uh, five regiments of what comprises the garrison. Uh, so yeah, uh, four-round action. Quite cool. Kind of unit cards for the partisans. They, yeah, these are partisans have been almost turned into regular units by the looks of it. They've got kind of uh, some kind of regular sort of Austrian uh, uniform. Um, that's Kronstadt in the bag. That's a pretty successful action. Um, the next engagement then is to the north at Schesburg. Again, 91,000 Austrians. We inflict 6,355 casualties. Take 2,600. It's a victory, but it's, it's not any kind of committed action. I guess Austrians just fall back. Um, vacate the position, but yeah, the idea really is to alleviate pressure from the West uh, to kind of try and begin to develop. You know, the, the Austrians seem to be recovering in Russian held territory. It's a large Russian army there. Um, mm. Tricky, very tricky. I'll have to think about what to do here. It's a tricky situation. I'm reticent to abandon it because really that's the blade in the heart kind of thing. All we have to do is to keep it there and twist it, you know. Um, it's whether we can hold this position. And the problem is there is the prospect of losing that command entirely. I mean, okay, great. We hold Vienna for an extra fortnight or an extra month or however long. But at the loss of, of what, an entire army command? Um, plus possibly our best general if he's killed. 
it's a dangerous, dangerous old sort of situation. The only thing we've got going for us, again, is the collapse of Austrian morale, the kind of paralysis that, that this would have induced in their command and control. But it typically takes a couple of turns for that to set in. Um, I think it seems to be the case anyway. So that's it. That's all the combat reports. Um, I'll leave it here because the video is probably is becoming quite long, and the last video was more than an hour, I think. So, um, And the next video will begin in late November, so we'll probably finish off the year then in the next video. Um, push on into the winter and, yeah, see if we can hold this position in Vienna. Um, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.